Miss Rizzle is here, and I thought we'd start off by introducing Josh and have him share a little bit about his work as a salmon scientist. And I'd ask him some of your really good questions that you had, and we'll go ahead and, and let Josh take it away. So this is my, my husband's colleague, Josh Chamberlain, and I'm going to let him introduce himself, and, and so you can learn about what he does with salmon. Thanks, Ms. Brizzle. Hi, everybody. I'm Josh. I'm a salmon scientist researcher here in Seattle with NOAA, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. We do a lot of our research here in Puget Sound locally and all the rivers and estuaries and then out in the marine waters of, of Puget Sound proper. I'm, I'm excited to hear what questions you have, and I'll do my best to answer them uh, as best as I can. So. Okay, awesome. All right, here's question number one. How do you tell the difference between female and male salmon? That's a good question. So the easiest way to tell the difference between a female and a male is looking at the returning adults. So when the adults come back, two things happen. The females and the males tend to turn different colors and the females and the males start to get different shapes to their heads. So the males tend to be larger, sometimes a little bit darker in color and usually uh, for some species, Chinook, uh, the coho, and the chum will get a very hooked nose. And those hooked noses are, are uh, yes, just like that. <laughs> that is how you can distinguish a, a male from a female generally. The, the, the males will have a, a very pronounced hook in their nose, just like the, the stuffed animal you just saw there. Yeah. Other than that, at, when, they're, when the salmon are little, or even when they're, they're, they're not colored and they're not uh, returning to their streams, it's really difficult to tell a male from a female at that point. Okay. But good question. Yeah. How does salmon find their way back to where they were born? This is, this is what makes salmon so unique. So uh, salmon, you, when, they, when they are born in the streams, they do something that we, say, that we call is imprinting, is basically they're smelling, they're taking in the scents and the chemicals of the, the streams that they're in. And this imprints on their, their bodies and their brains. And so when they leave the system, these small differences in, in, in the chemicals and the scents that they have in these streams, when they return, they're able to pick those up and find exactly where they came from when they left the streams. That's amazing, yeah. And how, are there a lot of salmon coming back to streams this year? Or how does this year compare, or do you know yet? <laughs> yeah, so the, the interesting thing about that is there's a lot of things that go into um, what we call a forecast for how many salmon will come back each year. It depends on the number of fish that left the stream uh, for that particular group of fish. It depends on the conditions that they experience in the ocean, how much they're able to eat, and it depends on the level of fishing that occurs. So all of these things uh, taken into consideration, then we're able to figure out a, a number or a, an estimate of how many fish will come back. This year compared to last year, uh, it's hard to say right now. Um, also, one thing to keep in mind are that the different species will be affected by different uh, parts of this, these conditions, as I just uh, stated differently. So you may have typically, if it's a pink salmon year, a lot of pinks will come back, whereas Chinook salmon tend to be the, the, the smallest numbers of fish come back. So what is it this year? What, what, what is the, the uh, is it a pink year or is it a Chinook year? What is it? This is a pink return year. So there okay. will be pink coming back this year, which means the pinks will be leaving the stream again next year. Okay. Okay. All right. And then what's next year going to be? Or, well, the, the so or the, the thing with, year? <laughs> yeah, so the, what, what gets a little bit confusing about this is so pinks come back every two years. So they're okay. the only species that has a really distinct on-year, off-year uh, sort of pattern. So they'll leave one year, they'll return the next year. All the other fish or all the other species will return over a period of years. So it's a little bit more okay. complex. They're always so returning and always leaving. Yeah, we talked about how the, we had the five different species and we talked about how they have a varying number of years they're out in the ocean, mm -hmm. but those years change is what you're saying. Like it's not that Except they overlap each salmon. other. Except yeah. for okay. the pink salmon, every, the other species uh, tend to have some differences in, in when they'll come back with the Chinook being the most complex or the most diverse where they'll return from either 
one year in the ocean to maybe six years in the ocean. Wow. Okay. So it's not really predictable how, so some of them come back a lot younger than the others. That's right. Okay. okay. <laughs> oh, here's an interesting question. Are there salmon in South America? So there are salmon in South America, but they're not native. So what I mean by native is that those fish didn't, those salmon did not start in South America. They were brought to South America and then raised down there. And most of the, 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 the reason for that is mostly around aquaculture or growing fish so people can harvest them and eat them. Um, they've taken Pacific salmon, so all the species you guys have talked about, and, and mostly coho and chinook. They've taken them down there and, and raised them in, in aquaculture pens. And in some cases, they've released them into some of the streams in, in far, the far southern tip of South America oh, wow. for fishing. But all of those fish have been, been taken down there and none of them have started there. Wow. And the interesting okay. thing now is that there's actually programs to try to remove them because they're starting to uh -huh. uh, have an impact on some of the native species, the species that came from South America and, and are, are native to South America the salmon that we've brought down there are starting to negatively impact them in some cases. Oh, right. Okay. That makes sense. So how, why are salmon so slimy? <laughs> we were wondering about why they're so slimy. Yeah. So that slime is really there as a, a protective layer. And, and most of the, the, the main reason for that is so that little bugs or what we call parasites, have a harder time sticking to the salmon and aren't able to latch on and therefore the fewer parasites uh, the healthier the salmon is likely. So it's really there as just a protective layer. Okay. But it is pretty slimy. Yeah did they get it from frogs? That's a good question. I would have to look into that. I'm not sure but I, I imagine that the sliminess on frogs is, is somewhat similar. Whether it came from the same same place I'm not sure. Okay. And do you ever use underwater cameras in the work that you do? So I don't use cameras myself in my research, but a lot of the people that I work with do. And there's a couple of ways that cameras are used. One is uh, there's something, well, if, if you're diving, some divers will use cameras to, to count fish along a, what we call a transect or a line that they move along. Same sort of thing uh, in rivers, people will snorkel and use cameras to help them while they count fish in the, in the stream. Another way that cameras are used um, is to count returning adults in, in some rivers. And what a, a, they'll put a camera in the river and basically, uh, it's kind of like a camera, it's kind of like a, a, a sonar, so a sound wave that goes out and it'll bounce off these fish and they're able to tell the size and the species based on the shape that comes back to the camera. And from that, they can determine how many fish have gone back up the river. Cool. Um, can salmon ever be dangerous? Not typically. I'd say the most dangerous thing about a salmon is if you were in a stream and there was some dead adult salmon and you happen to cut your finger on one of their teeth, you may get an infection because there's bacteria that hang around there. But when salmon are alive, there's generally nothing dangerous about them. Okay. <laughs> Hmm, I, we wondered about how does it, what does it feel like for a salmon to lay eggs? Hmm, that's a good question. I would guess that it's, uh, I, I'm not really sure how to answer that, honestly. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I, I certainly don't think it's painful, but uh, it, it looks like, you know, I've seen salmon laying eggs a few times and um, it certainly looks like an, an interesting process, but I'm not sure how it actually feels. So that's yeah, weird. it's hard to know how an animal feels, isn't it? Yeah. Hmm, how do how big do the biggest salmon get, or maybe even how big is the biggest salmon you've ever seen? So the biggest salmon um, tend well, this, as the stories go, most of the biggest salmon don't actually aren't aren't around anymore, but some of the biggest salmon that had ever existed were, were two meters long, so maybe up to six wow. feet long, and, and sometimes over a hundred pounds. So that's like twice the size of this salmon right here, at yeah. least. And it's taller than I am. Wow. So unfortunately, salmon, we don't have salmon like that anymore. Yeah, you, you know, they're, there's, they're few and far between, where, you know, in the past, uh, when salmon were more abundant, I think some of those larger 
fish were, were uh, more frequent in, in some of the systems and, and some of the river systems were really known for like the, the Elwha prior to when the dams were put up was known for really, really large Chinook salmon. Wow. Now the largest salmon I've seen has been about four feet long and it probably oh, weighed 65 pounds. Wow, well. that's pretty big though. <laughs> yes, and it was big. It was, it was, it was quite large and I couldn't the, the, I could not get my, my hand around the back of where the tail attached to the body. So. And where was that? That was in Alaska. Wow. Yeah. Cool. So that was pretty nice to see. And it was, it was, uh, it was a very big fish. Where do you, where do you work exactly now? So all of my work is in Puget Sound. I do a lot of work in the Snohomish River and uh, outside the Snohomish River, but I also do a lot of work just across Puget Sound in general. Um, most of what I'm doing is, is, is looking at how salmon are using their habitat and how it impacts their growth, because growth is really important for how these fish survive. So what we're trying to do is trying to put these pieces together to, to see what habitats are using to grow what they're using to grow in those habitats and then relating that to their survival and how many fish come back. Wow. It's pretty important. <laughs> okay. So here's another, here's one last question for you. And I know that we probably have even more questions. We could just go on and on, but I respect your time. So I'm going to go ahead and send you a message, maybe with an email for any other questions that we have. Is that okay? That's great. I'd be happy okay. to. Okay, cool. Here's one more question. Did grown-up male salmon have teeth or do grown-up salmon at all have teeth? They do have teeth and when they get when they get older and when they return to the river to spawn, these teeth get actually pretty big and it's one of the things that in some cases will attract females to a male depending on how hooked their nose is and how big their teeth are. But males also use those teeth when they're spawning to fight off other males. Yikes. And so oftentimes on the, when, if you go to a river where you see spawning salmon, you'll see fish that have marks along their sides from, from males coming in and, and using their teeth to fight off Yikes. other males. So <laughs> they do Watch indeed out. have teeth. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, I'll be sharing some more anatomy of salmon um, content in the class too. So we'll be learning more about their teeth and their, um, and their whole function and their, and their, uh, interesting bodies as they change. That's for sure. That's great. <laughs> so that's I appreciate great. your time, Josh. Will you remind us again, what is your title? What is your, what is your job description title? Yeah, my title is I'm a research ecologist with, with research. the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, specifically at the Northwest Fisheries Science Center. Okay. So, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and how long have you been working with salmon in particular? Uh, I've been working with salmon as a researcher for about 15 years and right. uh, about five years prior to that I was working as a commercial fisherman in Alaska. Okay. So, All right. Yeah. So you spend have a lot, lot of time of with salmon. You've had yeah. a long time, long history with salmon. So we appreciate your expertise and for taking some time with us to talk about what you know and, and, uh, and we'll keep asking you maybe some more questions too. <laughs> I That's have great. some good uh some good scientists in action um, in my classes. So they seem to generate some interesting questions. So <laughs> thank Sounds you for good. I had the fun. time to answer them. <laughs> thanks for the questions, right. everyone. Yeah, thanks, Josh. All I'll right. see you later, okay? Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>